Napoleonic Wars The Napoleonic Wars were a series of wars between Napoleon's French Empire and opposing coalitions led by Great Britain. As a continuation of the wars sparked by the French Revolution of 1789, they revolutionized European armies and played out on an unprecedented scale, mainly owing to the application of modern mass conscription. French power rose quickly as Napoleon's armies conquered much of Europe but collapsed rapidly after France's disastrous invasion of Russia in 1812. Napoleon was defeated in 1814. He returned and was finally defeated in 1815 at Waterloo, and all France's gains were taken away by the victors. Before a final victory against Napoleon, five of seven coalitions saw defeat at the hands of France. France defeated the First and Second Coalitions during the French Revolutionary Wars, the Third, notably at Austerlitz, the Fourth, notably at Gina, Elay, and Friedland, and the Fifth Coalition, notably at Wagram, under the leadership of Napoleon. These great victories gave the French army a sense of invulnerability, especially when it approached Moscow. But after the retreat from Russia, in spite of incomplete victories, France was defeated by the Sixth Coalition at Leipzig, in the Peninsular War at Vitoria and at the hands of the Seventh Coalition at Waterloo. The wars resulted in the dissolution of the Holy Roman Empire and sowed the seeds of nation nationalism in Germany and Italy that would lead to the two nations' respective consolidations later in the century. Meanwhile, the global Spanish Empire began to unravel as French occupation of Spain weakened Spain's hold over its colonies, providing an opening for nationalist revolutions in Spanish America. As a direct result of the Napoleonic Wars, the British Empire became the foremost world power for the next century, thus beginning Pax Britannica, and the Russian Empire, after the Battle of Paris in 1814, became, until the Crimean War in 1853, the paramount continental power of Europe. No consensus exists about when the French Revolutionary Wars ended and the Napoleonic Wars began. An early candidate is November 9, 1799, the date of Bonaparte's coup seizing power in France. However, the most common date is May 18, 1803, when renewed war broke out between Britain and France, ending the one-year-old peace of Amiens, the only period of general peace in Europe between 1792 and 1814. Most actual fighting ceased following Napoleon's final defeat at Waterloo on June 18, 1815, although skirmishing continued as late as July 3, 1815 at the Battle of Issy. The Second Treaty of Paris officially ended the wars on November 20, 1815. Background 1789-1802 News of the French Revolution of 1789 was received with great alarm by the rulers of France's neighbors, which only increased with the arrest and eventual execution of King Louis XVI of France. The first attempt to crush the French Republic came in 1793 when Austria, the Kingdom of Sardinia, the Kingdom of Naples, Prussia, Spain and the Kingdom of Great Britain formed the first coalition. French measures, including general conscription, levy en masse, military reform, and total war, contributed to the defeat of the first coalition despite the civil war occurring in France. The war ended when General Napoleon Bonaparte forced the Austrians to accept his terms in the Treaty of Campo Formio. Only Great Britain remained opposed to the French Republic. The Second Coalition was formed in 1798 by Austria, Great Britain, the Kingdom of Naples, the Ottoman Empire, the Papal States, Portugal, Russia, Sweden and other states. During the War of the Second Coalition, the French Republic suffered from corruption and internal division under the Directory, five directors holding executive power. France also lacked funds, and no longer had the services of Le Carnot, the war minister who had guided it to successive victories following extensive reforms during the early 1790s. Bonaparte, the main architect of victory in the last years of the First Coalition, had gone to campaign in Egypt missing two of its most important military figures from the previous conflict, the Republic suffered successive defeats against revitalized enemies whom British financial support brought back into the war. Bonaparte returned from Egypt to France on August 23, 1799, 
and seized control of the French government on November 9, 1799 in the coup of 18 Brumaire. Brumaire was a month in the French Republican calendar from late October to late November, replacing the Directory with the consulate led by himself. He reorganized the French military and created a reserve army position to support campaigns either on the Rhine or in Italy. On all fronts, French advances caught the Austrians off guard and knocked Russia out of the war. In Italy, Bonaparte won a notable victory against the Austrians at Marengo in 1800, but the decisive win came at Hohenlinden later that year. The defeated Austrians left the conflict after the Treaty of Lunaville, February 9, 1801, forcing Britain to sign the Peace of Amiens with France. Thus the Second Coalition ended in another French triumph, albeit an incomplete one as Britain continued to finance France's continental enemies and encourage hostility towards France. London had brought the Second Coalition together through subsidies, and Bonaparte realized that without either defeating the British or signing a treaty with them he could not achieve complete peace. Start date and nomenclature no consensus exists as to when the French Revolutionary Wars ended and the Napoleonic Wars began. Possible dates include November 9, 1799, when Bonaparte seized power on 18 Brumaire in France. Or May 18, 1803, when Britain and France ended the one short period of peace between 1792 and 1814, or December 2, 1804, when Bonaparte crowned himself emperor. British historians occasionally refer to the nearly continuous period of warfare from 1792 to 1815 as the Great French War, or as the final phase of the Anglo-French Second Hundred Years' War, spanning the period 1689 to 1815. In France, the Napoleonic Wars are generally integrated with the French Revolutionary Wars, les guerres de la Révolution et de l'Empire. Napoleon's Tactics Napoleon was, and remains, famous for his battlefield victories, and historians have spent enormous attention in analyzing them. In 2008, Donald Sutherland wrote, After 1807, Napoleon's creation of a highly mobile, well-armed artillery force gave artillery increased tactical importance. Napoleon, rather than relying on infantry to wear away the enemy's defenses, now could use massed artillery as a spearhead to pound a break in the enemy's line. Once that was achieved he sent in infantry and cavalry. War between Britain and France, 1803-1814 Unlike its many coalition partners, Britain remained at war throughout the period of the Napoleonic Wars. Protected by naval supremacy, in the words of Admiral Jervis to the House of Lords I do not say, my lords, that the French will not come. I say only they will not come by sea, Britain maintained low-intensity land warfare on a global scale for over a decade. The British government paid out large sums of money to other European states, so that they could pay armies in the field against France. These payments are colloquially known as the Golden Cavalry of St. George. The British Army provided long-term support to the Spanish Rebellion in the Peninsular War of 1808-1814, assisted by Spanish guerrilla, little war tactics. Anglo-Portuguese forces under Arthur Wellesley supported the Spanish, which campaigned successfully against the French armies, eventually driving them from Spain, thus allowing Britain to invade southern France. By 1815, the British Army played the central role in the final defeat of Napoleon at Waterloo. In 1802, Napoleon victoriously brought to an end the War of the Second Coalition, with only Great Britain remaining formally at war. Isolated, Britain reluctantly agreed to end hostilities under the Treaty of Amiens, March 25, 1802. Bonaparte tried to exploit the brief peace at sea to restore French colonial rule in Haiti. The expedition though initially successful, would soon turn to a disaster, with the French commander Charles Lecoluc, dying of yellow fever and almost his entire force destroyed by the disease. Napoleon gave up his New World dreams and sold Louisiana to the United States in 1803. Great Britain violated the terms of the Treaty of Amiens by occupying Malta and gathered a third coalition against France. The French intervention in the Swiss civil strife, a breach of the Treaty of Lunaville. 1801, 
between France and the Holy Roman Empire which guaranteed Swiss sovereignty, was taken as a pretext by the British to break the peace of Amiens and declare war on France on May 18, 1803. The coalition's war aims changed over the course of the conflict. A general desire to restore the French monarchy became closely linked to the struggle to stop Bonaparte. Beyond minor naval actions against British imperial interests, the Napoleonic Wars were much less global in scope than preceding conflicts such as Seven Years' War, which historians term a world war. Economic Warfare in response to the naval blockade of the French coasts enacted by the British government on May 16, 1806, Napoleon issued the Berlin Decree on November 21, 1806, which brought into effect the continental system. This policy aimed to eliminate the threat from Britain by closing French-controlled territory to its trade. Britain maintained a standing army of just 220,000 on paper at the height of the Napoleonic Wars of which less than half was available for campaigning the rest being necessary for garrisoning Ireland and the colonists or providing security for England. France's strength peaked at around 400,000 frontline soldiers. Both nations also enlisted large numbers of sedentary militia but they were unsuited for actual campaigning and were mostly employed to release regular forces for active duty. The Royal Navy effectively disrupted France's extra-continental trade both by seizing and threatening French shipping and by seizing French colonial possessions, but could do nothing about France's trade with the major continental economies and posed little threat to French territory in Europe. Also, France's population and agricultural capacity far outstripped that of Britain. However, Britain had the greatest industrial capacity in Europe, and its mastery of the seas allowed it to build up considerable economic strength through trade. That sufficed to ensure that France could never consolidate its control over Europe in peace. However, many in the French government believed that cutting Britain off from the continent would end its economic influence over Europe and isolate it. Financing the war A key element in British success was its ability to mobilize the nation's industrial and financial resources and apply them to defeating France. With a population of 16 million Britain was barely half the size of France with 30 million. In terms of soldiers the French advantage was offset by British subsidies that paid for a large proportion of the Austrian and Russian soldiers, peaking at about 450,000 men in 1813. By the terms of the Anglo-Russian Agreement of 1803, Britain paid a subsidy of L1.5 million pounds for every 100,000 Russian soldiers in the field. Most important, the British national output remained strong and the well-organized business sector channeled products into what the military needed. Britain used its economic power to expand the Royal Navy, doubling the number of frigates and increasing the number of large ships of the line by 50%, while increasing the roster of sailors from 15,000 to 133,000 in eight years after the war began in 1793. France, meanwhile, saw its navy shrink by more than half. The system of smuggling finished products into the continent undermined French efforts to ruin the British economy by cutting off markets. Subsidies to Russia and Austria kept them in the war. The British budget in 1814 reached PS 66 million, including PS 10 million for the Royal Navy, PS 40 million for the Army, PS 10 million for the Allies, and PS 38 million as interest on the national debt. The national debt soared to PS 679 million, more than double the GDP. It was willingly supported by hundreds of thousands of investors and taxpayers, despite the higher taxes on land and a new income tax. The whole cost of the war came to PS 831 million. By contrast, the French financial system was inadequate, and Napoleon's forces had to rely in part on requisitions from conquered lands. War of the Third Coalition 1805 Britain gathered together allies to form the Third Coalition against France. In response, Napoleon seriously considered an invasion of Great Britain, and massed 180,000 effectives at Boulogne. However, before he could invade, he needed to achieve naval superiority, or at least to pull the British fleet away from the English Channel. 
a complex plan to distract the British by threatening their possessions in the West Indies failed when a Franco-Spanish fleet under Admiral Villeneuve turned back after an indecisive action off Cape Finisterre on July 22, 1805. The Royal Navy blockaded Villeneuve and Cadiz until he left for Naples on October 19. The British squadron caught and overwhelmingly defeated the combined enemy fleet in the Battle of Trafalgar on October 21. The British commander, Lord Nelson, died in the battle. Napoleon would never again have the opportunity to challenge the British at sea, nor to threaten an invasion. He again turned his attention to enemies on the continent. The French army left Boulogne and moved towards Austria. In April 1805, Britain and Russia signed a treaty with the aim of removing the French from the Batavian Republic, roughly present-day Netherlands, and the Swiss Confederation, Switzerland. Austria joined the alliance after the annexation of Genoa and the proclamation of Napoleon as King of Italy on March 17, 1805. Sweden, which had already agreed to lease Swedish Pomerania as a military base for British troops against France, formally entered the coalition on August 9. The Austrians began the war by invading Bavaria with an army of about 70,000 under Karl Mack von Liebereck and the French army marched out from Boulogne in late July 1805 to confront them. At Alm, September 25-20 October, Napoleon surrounded Mack's army, forcing its surrender without significant losses. With the main Austrian army north of the Alps defeated, another army under Archduke Charles maneuvered inconclusively against André Massino's French army in Italy, Napoleon occupied Vienna. Far from his supply lines, he faced a larger Austro-Russian army under the command of Mikhail Kutyatsev, with the Emperor Alexander I of Russia personally present. On December 2, Napoleon crushed the joint Austro-Russian army in Moravia at Austerlitz, usually considered his greatest victory. He inflicted a total of 25,000 casualties on a numerically superior enemy army while sustaining fewer than 7,000 in his own force. Austria signed the Treaty of Pressburg. December 26, 1805, and left the coalition. The treaty required the Austrians to give up Venetia to the French-dominated Kingdom of Italy and the Tyrol to Bavaria. With the withdrawal of Austria from the war, stalemate ensued. Napoleon's army had a record of continuous unbroken victories on land, but the full force of the Russian army had not yet come into play. War of the Fourth Coalition 1806-1807 Within months of the collapse of the Third Coalition, the Fourth Coalition, 1806-07, against France was formed by Britain, Prussia, Russia, Saxony, and Sweden. In July 1806, Napoleon formed the Confederation of the Rhine out of the many tiny German states which constituted the Rhineland and most other western parts of Germany. He amalgamated many of the smaller states into larger electorates, duchies and kingdoms to make the governance of non-Prussian Germany smoother. Napoleon elevated the rulers of the two largest confederation states, Saxony and Bavaria, to the status of kings. In August 1806, the Prussian king, Frederick William III decided to go to war independently of any other great power. The army of Russia, a Prussian ally, in particular was too far away to assist. In September, Napoleon unleashed all the French forces east of the Rhine. Napoleon himself defeated a Prussian army at Gina, October 14, 1806, and Devout defeated another at Auerstadt on the same day. Some 160,000 French soldiers, increasing in number as the campaign went on, attacked Prussia, moving with such speed that they destroyed the entire Prussian army as an effective military force. Out of 250,000 troops the Prussians sustained 25,000 casualties, lost a further 150,000 prisoners, 4,000 artillery pieces, and over 100,000 muskets. At Gina, Napoleon had fought only a detachment of the Prussian force. Auerstadt involved a single French corps defeating the bulk of the Prussian army. Napoleon entered Berlin on October 27, 1806. He visited the tomb of Frederick the Great and instructed his marshals to remove their hats there, saying, if he were alive we wouldn't be here today. In total, 
Napoleon had taken only 19 days from beginning his attack on Prussia until knocking it out of the war with the capture of Berlin and the destruction of its principal armies at Jena and Auerstadt. By contrast, Prussia had fought for three years in the War of the First Coalition with little achievement. Saxony quit Prussia and together with small states from North Germany allied with France. In the next stage of the war the French drove Russian forces out of Poland and employed many Polish and German soldiers in several sieges in Silesia and Pomerania, with the assistance of Dutch and Italian soldiers in the latter case. Then Napoleon turned north to confront the remainder of the Russian army and to try to capture the temporary Prussian capital at Konigsberg. A tactical draw at Ilay, 7-8 February 1807, followed by capitulation at Danzig, May 24, 1807, and Battle of Heilsberg, June 10, 1807, forced the Russians to withdraw further north. Napoleon then routed the Russian army at Friedland, June 14, 1807. Following this defeat, Alexander had to make peace with Napoleon at Tilsit, July 7, 1807. In Germany and Poland new Napoleonic client states, like the Kingdom of Westphalia, Duchy of Warsaw and Republic of Danzig were established. By September, Marshal Brun completed the occupation of Swedish Pomerania, allowing the Swedish army, however, to withdraw with all its munitions of war. In early September 1807, Britain attacked neutral Denmark, conducting a naval bombardment of Copenhagen in order to make Denmark surrender its fleet. The large Danish fleet posed a possible threat in that it might replace many of the ships France had lost at Trafalgar in 1805. The British attack led Denmark to join the war on the side of France. At the Congress of Erfurt, September-October 1808, Napoleon and Alexander agreed that Russia should force Sweden to join the continental system, which led to the Finnish War of 1808-09 and to the division of Sweden into two parts separated by the Gulf of Bothnia. The eastern part became the Russian Grand Duchy of Finland. Poland In 1807 Napoleon created a powerful outpost of his empire in Eastern Europe. Poland had recently been partitioned by its three large neighbors, but Napoleon created the Grand Duchy of Warsaw, which depended on France from the very beginning. The duchy consisted of lands seized in Russia, Austria, and Prussia. Its Grand Duke was Napoleon's ally the King of Saxony, but Napoleon appointed the intendants who ran the country. The population of four, three million was released from occupation and by 1814 sent about 200,000 men to Napoleon's armies. That included about 90,000 who marched with him to Moscow. Few marched back. The Russians strongly opposed any move toward an independent Poland and one reason Napoleon invaded Russia in 1812 was to punish them. The Grand Duchy was dissolved in 1815 and Poland would not be a state until 1918. However Napoleon's impact on Poland was dramatic, including the Napoleonic legal code, the abolition of serfdom, and the introduction of modern middle-class bureaucracies. War of the Fifth Coalition 1809 The Fifth Coalition, 1809, of Britain and Austria against France formed as Britain engaged in the Peninsular War in Spain and Portugal. Again Britain stood alone, and the sea became the major theatre of war against Napoleon's allies. During the time of the Fifth Coalition, the Royal Navy won a succession of victories in the French colonies. On land, the Fifth Coalition attempted few extensive military endeavors. 1. The Waltron Expedition of 1809, involved a dual effort by the British Army and the Royal Navy to relieve Austrian forces under intense French pressure. It ended in disaster after the Army commander, John Pitt, 2nd Earl of Chatham, failed to capture the objective, the naval base of French-controlled Antwerp. For the most part of the years of the Fifth Coalition, British military operations on land, apart from the Iberian Peninsula, remained restricted to hit-and-run operations executed by the Royal Navy, which dominated the sea after having beaten down almost all substantial naval opposition from France and its allies and blockading what remained of France's naval forces in heavily fortified French-controlled ports. These rapid attack operations were aimed mostly at destroying blockaded French naval and mercantile shipping and the disruption of French supplies, communications, 
and military units stationed near the coasts. Often, when British allies attempted military actions within several dozen miles or so of the sea, the Royal Navy would arrive and would land troops and supplies and aid the coalition's land forces in a concerted operation. Royal Navy ships even provided artillery support against French units when fighting strayed near enough to the coastline. However, the ability and quality of the land forces governed these operations. For example, when operating with inexperienced guerrilla forces in Spain, the Royal Navy sometimes failed to achieve its objectives simply because of the lack of manpower that the Navy's guerrilla allies had promised to supply. Economic warfare continued. The French continental system against the British naval blockade of French controlled territory. Due to military shortages and lack of organization in French territory, many breaches of the continental system occurred as French dominated states tolerated or even encouraged trade with British smugglers. Both sides entered additional conflicts in attempts to enforce their blockade. The British fought the United States in the War of 1812, 1812-15 and the French engaged in the Peninsular War, 1808-14. The Iberian conflict began when Portugal continued trade with Britain despite French restrictions. When Spain failed to maintain the continental system, the uneasy Spanish alliance with France ended in all but name. French troops gradually encroached on Spanish territory until they occupied Madrid, and installed a client monarchy. This provoked an explosion of popular rebellions across Spain. Heavy British involvement soon followed. Austria, previously an ally of France, took the opportunity to attempt to restore its imperial territories in Germany as held prior to Austerlitz. Austria achieved a number of initial victories against the thinly spread army of Marshal Berthier. Napoleon had left Berthier with only 170,000 men to defend France's entire eastern frontier, in the 1790s. 800,000 men had carried out the same task, but holding a much shorter front. After defeats in Spain suffered by France, Napoleon took charge and enjoyed success, retaking Madrid, defeating the Spanish and forcing a withdrawal of the heavily outnumbered British army from the Iberian Peninsula, Battle of Corona, January 16, 1809. But when he left, the guerrilla war against his forces in the countryside continued to tie down great numbers of troops. Austria's attack prevented Napoleon from successfully wrapping up operations against British forces by necessitating his departure for Austria, and he never returned to the Peninsula Theatre. The British then sent in a fresh army under Sir Arthur Wellesley, later called the Duke of Wellington, whom the French could not stop. The Peninsula War proved a major disaster for France. Napoleon did well in when he was in direct charge, but that followed severe losses, and was followed by worse losses. He severely underestimated how much manpower would be needed. Spain proved to be a major, long-term drain on money, manpower and prestige. Historian David Gates called it the Spanish ulcer. France lost the Peninsular War. Napoleon realized it had been a disaster for his cause, writing later, that unfortunate war destroyed me. All the circumstances of my disasters are bound up in that fatal knot. Meanwhile the Austrians drove into the Duchy of Warsaw, but suffered defeat at the Battle of Rassen on April 19, 1809. The Polish army captured West Galicia following its earlier success. Napoleon assumed personal command in the east and bolstered the army there for his counter-attack on Austria. After a few small battles, the well-run campaign forced the Austrians to withdraw from Bavaria, and Napoleon advanced into Austria. His hurried attempt to cross the Danube resulted in the massive Battle of Aspenesling, May 22, 1809, Napoleon's first significant tactical defeat. But the Austrian commander, Archduke Charles, failed to follow up on his indecisive victory, allowing Napoleon to prepare and seize Vienna in early July. He defeated the Austrians at Wagram on 5th to 6th July. It was during the middle of that battle that Marshal Bernadotte was stripped of his command after retreating contrary to Napoleon's orders. Shortly thereafter, Bernadotte took up the offer from Sweden to fill the vacant position of Crown Prince there. Later he would actively participate in wars against his former emperor. The War of the Fifth Coalition ended with the Treaty of Schönbrunn, 
October 14, 1809. In the east, only the Tyrellus rebels led by Andreas Hofer continued to fight the French Bavarian army until finally defeated in November 1809, while in the west the Peninsular War continued. In 1810, the French Empire reached its greatest extent. On the continent, the British and Portuguese remained restricted to the area around Lisbon, behind their impregnable lines of Torres Vedras, and to besieged Cadiz. Napoleon married Marie Louise, an Austrian archduchess, with the aim of ensuring a more stable alliance with Austria and of providing the emperor with an heir, something his first wife, Josephine, had failed to do. As well as the French Empire, Napoleon controlled the Swiss Confederation, the Confederation of the Rhine, the Duchy of Warsaw and the Kingdom of Italy. Territories allied with the French included the Kingdom of Spain, under Joseph Bonaparte, Napoleon's elder brother, the Kingdom of Westphalia, Jerome Bonaparte, Napoleon's younger brother, the Kingdom of Naples, under Joachim Murat, husband of Napoleon's sister Caroline, the Principality of Lucca and Piombino, under Elisa Bonaparte, Napoleon's sister, and her husband Felice Bucchi, and Napoleon's former enemies, Prussia and Austria. The Invasion of Russia 1812 The Treaty of Tilsit in 1807 resulted in the Anglo-Russian War, 1807-12. Emperor Alexander I declared war on Britain after the British attack on Denmark in September 1807. British men of war supported the Swedish fleet during the Finnish War and scored victories over the Russians in the Gulf of Finland in July 1808 and August 1809. However, the success of the Russian army on the land forced Sweden to sign peace treaties with Russia in 1809 and with France in 1810 and to join the continental blockade against Britain. But Franco-Russian relations became progressively worse after 1810, and the Russian war with Britain effectively ended. In April 1812, Britain, Russia and Sweden signed secret agreements directed against Napoleon. The central issue for both Napoleon and Tsar Alexander I was control over Poland. Each wanted a semi-independent Poland he could control. As Estelle notes, implicit in the idea of a Russian Poland was, of course, a war against Napoleon. Schroeder says Poland was the root cause of Napoleon's war with Russia but Russia's refusal to support the continental system was also a factor. In 1812, at the height of his power, Napoleon invaded Russia with a pan-European Grand Army, consisting of 650,000 men, 270,000 Frenchmen and many soldiers of allies or subject areas. The French forces crossed the Niemen River on June 23, 1812. Russia proclaimed a patriotic war, while Napoleon proclaimed a second Polish war. The Poles supplied almost 100,000 men for the invasion force, but against their expectations, Napoleon avoided any concessions to Poland, having in mind further negotiations with Russia. The Grand Army marched through Russia, winning a number of relatively minor engagements and the major battle of Smolensk on 16th to 18th August. However, in the same days, a part of the French army led by Marshal Nicolas Audinot was stopped in the Battle of Politsk by the right wing of the Russian army, under command of General Peter Wittgenstein. This prevented the French march on the Russian capital, St. Petersburg. The fate of the invasion was to be decided in Moscow, where Napoleon himself led his forces. Russians used scorched earth tactics, and harried the Grand Army with light Cossack cavalry. The Grand Army did not adjust its operational methods in response. This refusal led to most of the losses of the main column of the Grand Army, which in one case amounted to 95,000 men, including deserters, in a single week. At the same time, the main Russian army retreated for almost three months. This constant retreat led to the unpopularity of Field Marshal Michael Andreas Barclay de Tully and a veteran, Prince Mikhail Kutyotsev was made the new commander-in-chief by Tsar Alexander O. Finally, the two armies engaged in the Battle of Borodino on September 7, in the vicinity of the Moscow. The battle was the largest and bloodiest single-day action of the Napoleonic Wars, involving more than 250,000 men and resulting in at least 70,000 casualties. It was indecisive. The French captured the main positions on the battlefield, 
but failed to destroy the Russian army. Logistical difficulties meant that French losses were irreplaceable, unlike Russian ones. Napoleon entered Moscow on September 14, after the Russian army retreated yet again. But by then, the Russians had largely evacuated the city and even released criminals from the prisons to inconvenience the French. Furthermore, the governor, Count Fyodor Rostopchin, ordered the city to be burnt. Alexander I refused to capitulate, and the peace talks, attempted by Napoleon, failed. In October, with no sign of clear victory in sight, Napoleon began the disastrous Great Retreat from Moscow. At the Battle of Maloyaroslavets the French tried to reach Kalaga, where they could find food and forage supplies. But the replenished Russian army blocked the road, and Napoleon was forced to retreat the same way he had come to Moscow, through the heavily ravaged areas along the Smolensk Road. In the following weeks, the Grand Army was dealt a catastrophic blow by the onset of the Russian winter, the lack of supplies and constant guerrilla warfare by Russian peasants and irregular troops. When the remnants of the Napoleon's army crossed the Beres in a river in November, only 27,000 fit soldiers survived, with some 380,000 men dead or missing and 100,000 captured. Napoleon then left his men and returned to Paris, to prepare the defense against the advancing Russians, and the campaign effectively ended on December 14, 1812, when the last enemy troops left Russia. The Russians had lost around 210,000 men, but with their shorter supply lines, they soon replenished their armies. War of the Sixth Coalition 1812-1814 Seeing an opportunity in Napoleon's historic defeat, Prussia, Sweden, Austria, and a number of German states re-entered the war. Napoleon vowed that he would create a new army as large as the one he had sent into Russia, and quickly built up his forces in the east from 30,000 to 130,000 and eventually to 400,000. Napoleon inflicted 40,000 casualties on the Allies at Lutzen, May 2, 1813, and Barton, 20 to 21 May 1813. Both battles involved total forces of over 250,000, making them some of the largest conflicts of the wars so far. Meanwhile, in the Peninsular War, Arthur Wellesley renewed the Anglo-Portuguese advance into Spain just after New Year in 1812, besieging and capturing the fortified towns of Ciudad Rodrigo, Bay de Jos, and in the Battle of Salamanca, which was a damaging defeat to the French. As the French regrouped, the Anglo-Portuguese entered Madrid and advanced towards Burgos, before retreating all the way to Portugal when renewed French concentrations threatened to trap them. As a consequence of the Salamanca campaign, the French were forced to end their long siege of Cadiz and to permanently evacuate the provinces of Andalusia and Asturias. In a strategic move, Wellesley planned to move his supply base from Lisbon to Santander. The Anglo-Portuguese forces swept northwards in late May and seized Burgos. On June 21, at Vitoria, the combined Anglo-Portuguese and Spanish armies won against Joseph Bonaparte finally breaking French power in Spain. The French had to retreat out of the Iberian Peninsula, over the Pyrenees. The belligerents declared an armistice from June 4, 1813, continuing until August 13, during which time both sides attempted to recover from the loss of approximately a quarter of a million total men in the preceding two months. During this time coalition negotiations finally brought Austria out in open opposition to France. Two principal Austrian armies took the field, adding an additional 300,000 men to the coalition armies in Germany. In total the Allies now had around 800,000 front-line soldiers in the German theater, with a strategic reserve of 350,000 formed to support the front-line operations. Napoleon succeeded in bringing the total imperial forces in the region to around 650,000, although only 250,000 came under his direct command with another 120,000 under Nicholas Charles Audenot and 30,000 under Devout. The remainder of imperial forces came mostly from the Confederation of the Rhine, especially Saxony and Bavaria. In addition, to the south, Murat's Kingdom of Naples and Eugene de Bihanas's Kingdom of Italy had a total of 100,000 armed men. In Spain, 
another 150,000 to 200,000 French troops steadily retreated before Anglo-Portuguese forces numbering around 100,000. Thus in total, around 900,000 Frenchmen in all theatres faced around 1,800,000 coalition soldiers, including the strategic reserve under formation in Germany. The gross figures may mislead slightly, as most of the German troops fighting on the side of the French fought at best unreliably and stood on the verge of defecting to the Allies. One can reasonably say that Napoleon could count on no more than 450,000 men in Germany, which left him outnumbered about four to one. Following the end of the armistice, Napoleon seemed to have regained the initiative at Dresden, August 1813 where he once again defeated a numerically superior coalition army and inflicted enormous casualties, while sustaining relatively few. However, the failures of his marshals and a slow resumption of the offensive on his part cost him any advantage that this victory might have secured. At the Battle of Leipzig in Saxony, 16th to 19th October 1813, also called the Battle of the Nations, 191,000 French fought more than 300,000 allies and the defeated French had to retreat into France. Napoleon then fought a series of battles, including the Battle of arcy sur orbe in France itself, but the overwhelming numbers of the Allies steadily forced him back. His remaining ally Denmark-Norway became isolated and fell to the coalition. The Allies entered Paris on March 30, 1814. During this time Napoleon fought his Six Days Campaign, in which he won multiple battles against the enemy forces advancing towards Paris. However, during this entire campaign he never managed to field more than 70,000 men against more than half a million coalition soldiers. At the Treaty of Chaumont, March 9, 1814, the Allies agreed to preserve the coalition until Napoleon's total defeat. Napoleon determined to fight on, even now, incapable of fathoming his massive fall from power. During the campaign he had issued a decree for 900,000 fresh conscripts, but only a fraction of these ever materialized, and Napoleon's schemes for victory eventually gave way to the reality of the hopeless situation. Napoleon abdicated on April 6. However, occasional military actions continued in Italy, Spain, and Holland throughout the spring of 1814. The victors exiled Napoleon to the island of Elba, and restored the French Bourbon monarchy in the person of Louis XVIII. They signed the Treaty of Fontainebleau, April 11, 1814, and initiated the Congress of Vienna to redraw the map of Europe. Gunboat War 1807-1814 Initially, Denmark-Norway declared itself neutral in the Napoleonic Wars, established a navy, and traded with both sides but the British attacked and captured or destroyed large portions of the Dano-Norwegian fleet in the First Battle of Copenhagen, April 2, 1801, and again in the Second Battle of Copenhagen, August-September 1807. This ended Dano-Norwegian neutrality, beginning an engagement in a naval guerrilla war in which small gunboats would attack larger British ships in Danish and Norwegian waters. The gunboat war effectively ended with a British victory at the Battle of Lingor in 1812, involving the destruction of the last large Dano-Norwegian ship, the frigate Nairden. War of 1812 Coinciding with the War of the Sixth Coalition, though technically not considered part of the Napoleonic Wars, was the War of 1812. The neutral United States declared war on Britain. One main reason was British interference with American merchant ships and forced enlistment into the British Navy. France had interfered too, and at one point the U.S. considered declaring war on France. The war ended in a military stalemate and there were no boundary changes at the Treaty of Ghent which took effect in early 1815, when Napoleon was on Elba. The main effect of the War of 1812 on the Napoleonic Wars was to let the Americans distract the British Navy giving the French a slight advantage. The Louisiana Purchase of 1803 came during the peaceful lull after Napoleon decided against building a new world empire. So he took Louisiana from Spain and sold it to the U.S. for $15 million, including $11 million in gold. War of the Seventh Coalition 1815 The Seventh Coalition, 1815, pitted Britain, 
Russia, Prussia, Sweden, Austria, the Netherlands and a number of German states against France. The period known as the Hundred Days began after Napoleon escaped from Elba and landed at Cannes, March 1, 1815. Traveling to Paris, picking up support as he went, he eventually overthrew the restored Louis XVIII. The Allies rapidly gathered their armies to meet him again. Napoleon raised 280,000 men, whom he distributed among several armies. To add to the 90,000 strong standing army, he recalled well over a quarter of a million veterans from past campaigns and issued a decree for the eventual draft of around 2.5 million new men into the French army. This faced an initial coalition force of about 700,000, although coalition campaign plans provided for 1 million frontline soldiers, supported by around 200,000 garrison, logistics and other auxiliary personnel. The coalition intended this force to have overwhelming numbers against the numerically inferior Imperial French Army, which in fact never came close to reaching Napoleon's goal of more than 2.5 million under arms. Napoleon took about 124,000 men of the Army of the North on a preemptive strike against the Allies in Belgium. He intended to attack the coalition armies before they combined, in hope of driving the British into the sea and the Prussians out of the war. His march to the frontier achieved the surprise he had planned, catching the Anglo-Dutch army in a dispersed arrangement. The Prussians had been more wary, concentrating three-quarters of their army in and around Ligny. The Prussians forced the Armée du Nord to fight all the day of the 15th to reach Ligny in a delaying action by the Prussian First Corps. He forced Prussia to fight at Ligny on June 16, 1815, and the defeated Prussians retreated in some disorder. On the same day, the left wing of the Armée du Nord, under the command of Marshal Michel Ney, succeeded in stopping any of Wellington's forces going to aid Blutra's Prussians by fighting a blocking action at Quatre Bras. Ney failed to clear the crossroads and Wellington reinforced the position. But with the Prussian retreat, Wellington too had to retreat. He fell back to a previously reconnoitred position on an escarpment at Mont Street Jean, a few miles south of the village of Waterloo. Napoleon took the reserve of the Army of the North, and reunited his forces with those of Ney to pursue Wellington's army, after he ordered Marshal Grouchy to take the right wing of the Army of the North and stop the Prussians regrouping. In the first of a series of miscalculations, both Grouchy and Napoleon failed to realize that the Prussian forces were already reorganized and were assembling at the village of Weber. In any event the French army did nothing to stop a rather leisurely retreat that took place throughout the night and into the early morning by the Prussians. As the 4th, 1st, and 2nd Prussian Corps marched through the town towards Waterloo the 3rd Prussian Corps took up blocking positions across the river, and although Grouchy engaged and defeated the Prussian rearguard under the command of L.T. Gen von Thielmann in the Battle of Weber, 18th to 19th June, it was 12 hours too late. In the end, 17,000 Prussians had kept 33,000 badly needed French reinforcements off the field. Napoleon delayed the start of fighting at the Battle of Waterloo on the morning of June 18 for several hours while he waited for the ground to dry after the previous night's rain. By late afternoon, the French army had not succeeded in driving Wellington's forces from the escarpment on which they stood. When the Prussians arrived and attacked the French right flank in ever-increasing numbers, Napoleon's strategy of keeping the coalition armies divided had failed and a combined coalition general advance drove his army from the field in confusion. Grouchy organized a successful and well-ordered retreat towards Paris, where Marshal Devout had 117,000 men ready to turn back the 116,000 men of Blücher and Wellington. Devout was defeated at Issy and negotiations for surrender had begun. On arriving at Paris three days after Waterloo, Napoleon still clung to the hope of a concerted national resistance. But the temper of the legislative chambers, and of the public generally, did not favor his view. Lacking support Napoleon abdicated again on June 22, 1815 and on July 15, surrendered himself to the British squadron at Rochefort. The Allies exiled him to the remote South Atlantic island of St. Helena, where he died on May 5, 1821. Meanwhile in Italy, Joachim Murat, whom the Allies had allowed to remain King of Naples after Napoleon's initial defeat, once again allied with his brother-in-law, triggering the Neapolitan War, marched to May, 
1815. Hoping to find support among Italian nationalists fearing the increasing influence of the Habsburgs in Italy, Murat issued the Romani proclamation inciting them to war. But the proclamation failed and the Austrians soon crushed Murat at the Battle of Tolentino, May 2 to May 3, 1815, forcing him to flee. The Bourbons returned to the throne of Naples on May 20, 1815. Murat tried to regain his throne, but after that failed, he was executed by firing squad on October 13, 1815. Political effects The Napoleonic Wars brought radical changes to Europe, but the reactionary forces returned to power and tried to reverse some of them. Napoleon had succeeded in bringing most of Western Europe under one rule. However, France's constant warfare with the combined forces of the other major powers of Europe for over two decades finally took its toll. By the end of the Napoleonic Wars, France no longer held the role of the dominant power in Europe, as it had since the times of Louis XIV. In its place, Britain emerged as the most important economic power, and its Royal Navy held unquestioned naval superiority across the globe well into the 20th century. In most European countries, subjugation in the French Empire brought with it many liberal methods of the French Revolution including democracy, due process in courts, abolition of serfdom, reduction of the power of the Catholic Church, and a demand for constitutional limits on monarchs. The increasing voice of the middle classes with rising commerce and industry meant that restored European monarchs found it difficult to restore pre-revolutionary absolutism, and had to retain many of the reforms enacted during Napoleon's rule. Institutional legacies remain to this day in the form of civil law legal systems, with clearly redacted codes compiling their basic laws, an enduring legacy of the Napoleonic Code. During the wake of the Napoleonic period, nationalism, a relatively new movement, became increasingly significant. This would shape much of the course of future European history. Its growth spelled the beginning of some states and the end of others, as the map of Europe changed dramatically in the hundred years following the Napoleonic era. Rule by fiefdoms and aristocracy was widely replaced by national ideologies based on shared origins and culture. Importantly, Bonaparte's reign over Europe sowed the seeds for the founding of the nation-states of Germany and Italy by starting the process of consolidating city-states, kingdoms and principalities. The Napoleonic Wars also played a key role in the independence of the Latin American colonies from Spain and Portugal. The conflict significantly weakened the authority and military power of Spain, especially after the Battle of Trafalgar. There were many uprisings in Spanish America, leading to the Wars of Independence. In Portuguese America, Brazil experienced greater autonomy as it now served as seat of the Portuguese Empire and ascended politically to the status of kingdom. These events also contributed to the Portuguese Liberal Revolution in 1820 and the independence of Brazil in 1822. Afterwards, in order to prevent another such war, the Congress of Vienna in 1814-15 reassigned territories in order to create a balance of power in which no one state would be able to dominate Europe the way Napoleonic France had. The balance on the whole kept Europe peaceful for 100 years. Another concept emerged that of a unified Europe. After his defeat, Napoleon deplored the fact that his dream of a free and peaceful European association remained unaccomplished. Such a European association would share the same principles of government, system of measurement, currency and civil code. Some one and a half centuries later, and after two world wars several of these ideals re-emerged in the form of the European Union. Military Legacy Enlarged scope The Napoleonic Wars also had a profound military impact. Until the time of Napoleon, European states employed relatively small armies, made up of both national soldiers and mercenaries. These regulars were highly drilled professional soldiers. These Antian regime armies could only deploy small field armies due to rudimentary staffs and comprehensive yet cumbersome logistics. Both issues combined to limit actual field forces to approximately 30,000 men under a single commander. However, military innovators in the mid-18th century began to recognize the potential of an entire nation at war, a nation in arms. 
the scale of warfare dramatically enlarged during the Revolutionary and subsequent Napoleonic Wars. Before, it was rare for a battle to involve more than 30,000 soldiers on each side. The French twin innovations of separate corps, allowing a single commander to efficiently command more than the traditional command span of 30,000 men, and living off the land, which allowed field armies to deploy more men without requiring an equal increase in supply arrangements such as depots and supply trains, allowed the French Republic to field much larger armies than their more traditional opponents. Napoleon subsequently ensured that what were effectively separate French field armies during the time of the French Republic operated as a single army under his control as emperor, often allowing him to substantially outnumber his opponents. This forced his continental opponents to increase the size of their armies as well, moving away from the traditional small, well-drilled Antian regime armies of the 18th century to mass conscript armies with its attendant political consequences. The Battle of Marengo, which largely ended the War of the Second Coalition was fought with less than 60,000 men on both sides. The Battle of Austerlitz which ended the War of the Third Coalition involved less than 160,000 men. The Battle of Friedland which led to peace with Russia in 1807 involved about 150,000 men. After these defeats, the Continental Powers developed various forms of mass conscription to allow them to face France on even terms and the size of field armies increased rapidly. The Battle of Wagram of 1809 involved 300,000 men, and 500,000 fought at Leipzig in 1813, of whom 150,000 were killed or wounded. About a million French soldiers became casualties, wounded, invalided or killed, a higher proportion than in the First World War. The European total may have reached 5 million military deaths, including disease. France had after Russia the largest population in Europe by the end of the 18th century, 27 million, as compared to Britain's 12 million and Russia's 35 to 40 million. It was well poised to take advantage of the levy en masse. Before Napoleon's efforts, Lazare Carnot played a large part in the reorganization of the French army from 1793 to 1794, a time which saw previous French misfortunes reversed, with Republican armies advancing on all fronts. The sizes of the armies involved give an obvious indication of the changes in warfare. During Europe's major pre-revolutionary war, the Seven Years' War of 1756-1763, Few armies ever numbered more than 200,000 in total with actual field forces often numbering less than 30,000. By contrast, the French army peaked in size in the 1790s with 1.5 million Frenchmen enlisted although actual strength was much less. Haphazard bookkeeping, rudimentary medical support and lax recruitment standards ensured that strength on paper never came close to actual strength as soldiers either never existed fell or were unable to withstand the physical demands of soldiering. And lastly, the French Republic could never have afforded such a large force. In total, about 2.8 million Frenchmen fought on land and about 150,000 at sea, bringing the total for France to almost 3 million combatants during almost 25 years of warfare. Britain had a total 750,000 men under arms between 1792 and 1815 as its army expanded from 40,000 men in 1793 to a peak of 250,000 men in 1813. Over 250,000 sailors served in the Royal Navy. In September 1812, Russia had 900,000 enlisted men in its land forces, and between 1799 and 1815 a total of 2.1 million men served in the its army. Another 200,000 served in the Russian Navy. Indicative of the discrepance between paper figures and actual field strength is that out of the alleged 900,000 men, the actual field armies deployed against France had numbered less than 250,000 altogether. There are no consistent statistics for other major combatants. Austria's forces peaked at about 576,000 and had little or no naval component yet never fielded more than 250,000 men in field armies. After Britain, Austria proved the most persistent enemy of France, more than a million Austrians served during the Long Wars. Prussia never had more than 320,000 men under arms at any time, with the bulk of its forces consisting of second-line and third-line troops unsuited for actual field operations. 
Spain's armies also peaked at around 200,000 men, not including more than 50,000 guerrillas scattered over Spain. In addition the Maratha Confederation, the Ottoman Empire, Italy, Naples and the Duchy of Warsaw each had more than 100,000 men under arms. Even small nations now had armies rivaling the size of the great powers forces of past wars but in reality, most of these were poor quality forces only suitable for garrison duties. The size of their actual combat troops remained modest yet these could still provide a welcome addition to the major powers. The percentage of French troops in the Grand Army which Napoleon led into Russia was about 50% while the French allies also provided a significant contribution to the French forces in Spain. As these small nations joined the coalition forces in 1813 to 1814, they provided a useful addition to the coalition while depriving Napoleon of much needed cannon fodder. Innovations The initial stages of the Industrial Revolution had much to do with larger military forces, it became easy to mass produce weapons and thus to equip significantly larger forces. Britain served as the largest single manufacturer of armaments in this period. It was the arsenal that supplied most of the weapons used by the coalition powers throughout the conflicts. France produced the second largest total of armaments, equipping its own huge forces as well as those of the Confederation of the Rhine and other allies. Napoleon himself showed innovative tendencies in his use of mobility to offset numerical disadvantages, as brilliantly demonstrated in the rout of the Austro-Russian forces in 1805 in the Battle of Austerlitz. The French army reorganized the role of artillery, forming independent, mobile units, as opposed to the previous tradition of attaching artillery pieces in support of troops. Another advance affected warfare, the semaphore system had allowed the French war minister, Carnot, to communicate with French forces on the frontiers throughout the 1790s. The French continued to use this system throughout the Napoleonic Wars. Additionally, aerial surveillance came into use for the first time when the French used a hot air balloon to survey coalition positions before the Battle of Fleurus, on June 26, 1794. Total War Historians have explored how the Napoleonic Wars became total wars. Most historians argue that the escalation in size and scope came from two sources. First was the ideological clash between revolutionary equalitarian and conservative hierarchical belief systems. Second was the emerging nationalism in France, Germany, Spain, and elsewhere that made these peoples wars instead of contests between monarchs. Bell has argued that even more important than ideology and nationalism were the intellectual transformations in the culture of war that came about through the Enlightenment. One factor he says was that war was no longer a routine event but a transforming experience for societies, a total experience. Secondly the military emerged in its own right as a separate sphere of society distinct from the ordinary civilian world. The French Revolution made every civilian a part of the war machine either as a soldier through universal conscription, or as a vital cog in the home front machinery supporting and supplying the army. Out of that, says Bell, came militarism, the belief that the military role was morally superior to the civilian role in times of great national crisis. The fighting army represented the essence of the nation's soul. As Napoleon himself proclaimed, it is the soldier who founds a republic and it is the soldier who maintains it. Last Veterans Jart Adrien's Beau Warm Guard, 1788-1899, was the last surviving veteran. He fought for France in the 33M Regiment Ledger, Louis Victor Bailot, 1793-1898, also from France, was the last Battle of Waterloo veteran. He also saw action at the Siege of Hamburg. See an 1898 photograph, Pedro Martinez, 1789 to 1898, was the last battle of Trafalgar veteran. He served in the Spanish Navy on San Juan Nepomuceno, Josephine Mazurkiewicz, 1794 to 1896, was the last female veteran. She was an assistant surgeon in Napoleon's army and later participated in the Crimean War. Private Morris Shear, 1795 to 1892, of the 73rd Foot, was the last British veteran. Sir Provo Wallace, 1791 to 1892, 
was the last Royal Navy officer. He saw action on HMS Shannon during the War of 1812, pictures of French veterans in uniform. In fiction Leo Tolstoy's epic novel, War and Peace recounts Napoleon's wars between 1805 and 1812, especially the disastrous 1812 invasion of Russia and subsequent retreat, from a Russian perspective. Stendhal's novel The Charter House of Parma opens with a ground-level recounting of the Battle of Waterloo and the subsequent chaotic retreat of French forces. Les Miserables by Victor Hugo takes place against the backdrop of the Napoleonic War and subsequent decades, and in its unabridged form contains an epic telling of the Battle of Waterloo. Adieu is a novella by Honor de Balzac in which can be found a short description of the French retreat from Russia, particularly the Battle of Berezina where the fictional couple of the story are tragically separated. Years later after imprisonment, the husband returns to find his wife still in a state of utter shock and amnesia. He has the battle and their separation reenacted, hoping the memory will heal her state. William Makepeace Thackeray's novel Vanity Fair takes place during the Napoleonic Wars, one of its protagonists dies at the Battle of Waterloo. The Duel, a short story by Joseph Conrad, recounts the story based on true events of two French Hussar officers who carry a long grudge and fight in duels each time they meet during the Napoleonic Wars. The short story was adapted by director Ridley Scott into the 1977 Cannes Film Festival's Best First Work award-winning film The Duelists, Le Colonel Chabot by Honor de Balzac. After being severely wounded during the Battle of Ilay, 1807, Chabot, a famous colonel of the Cuirassiers, was erroneously recorded as dead and buried unconscious with French casualties. After extricating himself from his own grave and being nursed back to health by local peasants, it takes several years for him to recover. When he returns in the Paris of the Bourbon Restoration, he discovers that his widow, a former prostitute that Chabot made rich and honorable, has married the wealthy Count Ferraud. She has also liquidated all of Chabot's belongings and pretends to not recognize her first husband. Seeking to regain his name and monies that were wrongly given away as inheritance, he hires Derville, an attorney, to win back his money and his honor. The Count of the Monte Cristo by Alexander Dumas, who starts during the tail end of the Napoleonic Wars. The main character, Edmond Dantes, suffers imprisonment following false accusations of Bonapartist leanings. The novelist Jane Austen lived much of her life during the French Revolutionary and Napoleonic Wars and two of her brothers served in the Royal Navy. Austen almost never refers to specific dates or historical events in her novels, but wartime England forms part of the general backdrop to several of them, in Pride and Prejudice, 1813, but possibly written during the 1790s, the local militia, civilian volunteers, has been called up for home defense and its officers play an important role in the plot. In Mansfield Park, 1814, Fanny Price's brother William is a midshipman, officer in training, in the Royal Navy. And in Persuasion, 1818, Frederick Wentworth and several other characters are naval officers recently returned from service. Charlotte Bronte's novel Shirley, 1849, set during the Napoleonic Wars, explores some of the economic effects of war on rural Yorkshire. Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's Brigadier Gerard serves as a French soldier during the Napoleonic Wars. Fyodor Dostoevsky's book The Idiot had a character, General Ivelgin, who witnessed and recounted his relationship with Napoleon during the Campaign of Russia. The Hornblower books by C. S. Forrester follow the naval career of Horatio Hornblower during the Napoleonic Wars. The Aubrey Maturin series of novels is a sequence of twenty historical novels by Patrick O'Brien portraying the rise of Jack Aubrey from lieutenant to rear admiral during the Napoleonic Wars. The film Master and Commander, the Far Side of the World starring Russell Crowe and directed by Peter Weir is based on this series of books. The Sharp series by Bernard Cornwell star the character Richard Sharp, a soldier in the British Army, who fights throughout the Napoleonic Wars. The Bloody Jack book series by Louis A. Mayer is set during the Second Coalition of the Napoleonic Wars, and retells many famous battles of the age. The heroine, Jackie, soon meets none other than Bonaparte himself. The Napoleonic Wars provide the backdrop for the Emperor, the Victory, the Regency and the Campaigners, Volumes 11, 12, 13 and 14 respectively of the Moorland Dynasty, 
a series of historical novels by author Cynthia Harrod Eagles. The Richard Bolliter series by Alexander Kent novels portray this period of history from a naval perspective. Dinah Dean's series of historical novels are set against the background of the Napoleonic Wars and are told from a Russian perspective The Road to Kaluga, Flight from the Eagle, The Eagle's Fate, The Wheel of Fortune, The Green Gallant follow a small group of soldiers, and their relatives, over months of campaigning from the fall of Moscow up to the liberation of Paris, the last three books The Ice King, Tatia's story, The River of Time fall some years later but have the same cast of characters. Julian Stockwin's Thomas Kite series portrays one man's journey from pressed man to admiral in the time of the French and Napoleonic Wars. Simon Scarrow, Napoleonic series. Rise of Napoleon and Wellington from humble beginnings to history's most remarkable and notable leaders. Four books in the series. The Lord Ramage series by Dudley Pope takes place during the Napoleonic Wars. Jeanette Winterson's 1987 novel The Passion, book. Brian Talbot's graphic novel Granville is set in an alternate history in which France won the Napoleonic War, invaded Britain and guillotined the British royal family. The Temrara series by Naomi Novik takes place in alternate universe Napoleonic Wars where dragons exist and serve in combat. Susanna Clarke's historical fantasy novel, Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell, takes place during the Napoleonic Wars. Much of the plot is driven by Mr. Norrell's successful campaign to convince the British government that magic can be employed to prosecute the peninsula.